you find any, Kevin? Wow. spot hmm. yeah it's hard on the neck
your wife come with you this time? Tell her I said hi. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the best tutorial track for ITSEC 2021. I'm Lee Lacey, the session chair for, this, for today's session, and I work for SORTEC here in Orlando. In the back is uh, Rob Lechner from Boeing St. Louis. He's the co-chair. This best tutorial track consists of the three tutorials that the tutorial board selected as candidates for the best tutorial award, which will be presented on Thursday. Hopefully you've downloaded the EdSec app by now. There's a way to get to a survey. We appreciate your feedback so that we can improve the conference and the tutorial sessions each year. At four o'clock this afternoon, there is a presentation for the EdSec Fellow 2021, who's Fred Hartman this year. So I encourage you to attend that if you can. So to the next tutorial we have today is 2101 Advanced Air Mobility Innovating Modeling and Simulation to Revolutionize the Future of Transportation. This tutorial was authored by Dr. Kevin Holm from the University at Buffalo's Stephen Still Institute for Sustainable Transportation and Logistics. And he has several co-authors that are listed on the cover page. Kevin has some wide experience with topics that are interesting to the modeling simulation community, including this one. His background is that he received his doctorate from the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at the University of Buffalo. He was specializing in multidisciplinary analysis and optimization of complex systems. Currently, he serves as the program manager for the Stephen Still Institute, and he also serves as a technical director for its motion simulation laboratory. His Current areas of technical focus include game-based approaches for applied modeling and simulation, human factors research and autonomous and connected vehicles, both ground and flight, simulation for advanced air mobility, experiential learning within next generation engineering curriculum design, and the design for, for additive manufacturing. He's also a certified modeling and simulation professional, a CMSP. So please join me in welcoming Kevin to the stage. Thank you, Lee. Thank you all for attending today. I appreciate it very much. It's great to be back live and in the flesh here at ITSEC. If you're like me, I missed being here greatly last year. Um, was not here for personal reasons, even though there was a virtual version of this conference. It's great to be here. Many thanks as well to the tutorial subcommittee for reviewing and ultimately accepting our tutorial. Uh, we're very grateful for, for that. Uh, quick shout out to my team. Uh, Panos, Steve, Rachel, Shahriar, Irina, and Gregorios, all of whom contributed to this tutorial. If you'll indulge me, I want to start with an anecdote. Um, a number of years ago, I, I had a meeting with Panos, who's one of the primary authors of this tutorial. And at the time, we were distant collaborators. Now, of course, we're close colleagues and friends. But we had this meeting, and we were, it was kind of a feel-out meeting, and he was someone I very much wanted to work with at the time. And he asked me, you know, he's just having conversation, chit-chat kind of thing. He said, you know, Kevin, what, what are you interested in? And what are you, what are you passionate about, about in life? And so I told him, I, you know, I'm into simulators and amusement rides and things like this that I've enjoyed my entire life. And so I extended him the same courtesy. I said, well, you know, Panos, what, what excites you? What fires you up? And he said, uh, Kevin, my, one of my life passions is, is flying cars. So he said this, and you almost have to put a freeze frame on the moment, because this was a moment in my life that's happened before, and I'm sure will happen again, when someone says something to me, and I'm not sure if they're being serious or not. I'm not sure if they're testing me, they're seeing what my reaction will be. So I kept a straight face, got through the meeting. It turns out Panos was very serious, but immediately subsequent to that discussion, I made it my mission 
to learn about this field and see what was going on out there. And what I learned was, admittedly, this is an immature field. But what I found out was m this field is much, much, much more mature than I had ever imagined going into that conversation. So I suppose I would credit that discussion three years ago now as being the primary impetus for us putting this tutorial together for you today. So I hope you enjoy it. Okay, so we had planned to do this a year ago. And in a way, it's a shame that we couldn't because you all might remember the theme of last year. The ITSIC theme was the future is now. And of course, that would have been absolutely perfect for this subject matter. So we held off a year. Luckily, the tutorial subcommittee liked what we did a year later. And of course, this year's themes certainly apply to what we're doing as well. Innovating and accelerating training and adapting to an unexpected future. And we're gonna to touch on both of these notions as we proceed through the tutorial today. But on the right-hand side of this slide is kind of the, the charge of the tutorial subcommittee. And we tried to put this together really with everyone in mind. So I would hope that we prepared this with some foundational topics in mind for all the various subcommittees, paper subcommittees here at ITSIC. Of course, training, simulation, and education being at the core of that. I would think that a topic like this is going to have refresher or advanced topics for any of you who might be considering CMSP certification. As I'm sure all of you have seen, there's a big push this year for CMSP with its 3.0 launch. Uh, so you're going to be seeing lots of that throughout the conference. But finally, admittedly, undeniably, I would say this is an emerging bleeding edge concept that hopefully is of pr particular interest to a, a variety, a wide variety of its attendees. So, I wanted to start off with a bit of media here to kind of get our, wet our whistles as it were. This was a video that was forwarded to me by one of our, our, our co-authors, Shahriar, and I just thought this was the cat's meow when I saw this. And like I said, w when I did a literature review to see what was going on in this field, I found out a lot of things that I did not know. And one of, one of the things I found out is that Uber is a huge player and a huge investor in this field already. So I can't take credit for this video. This was created by Uber. But what they're trying to imagine is what a future rideshare experience might look like in a surmised flying car future. Uh, and I, th I thought this was incredible. I think we can all relate to the fact that there's probably many industries, public, private, government, that could potentially stand to benefit from these technologies if we can actually get them to be realized and, and sustain. But I think all of us can, can resonate with rideshare. You know, we come here to Orlando and if we need to get from point to point, from point A to point B, we often rely on Uber or Lyft to do that. And depending on the traffic situation, depending on the length of your excursion, depending on the time of day, uh, this could be a, a great option looking ahead to the future. So anyway, something to think about what it might look like in 10, 20, 25, depending on how optimistic you are, number of years if we could get into an Uber or a rideshare flying car. Okay, an overview. Uh, I'll start off with an introduction and, and a formal statement of our learning objectives. Uh, I'll then go into some background, discuss some semantics, some terminology, uh, and then bridge into some ongoing challenges. Uh, two years ago at ITSEC 2019, our team was so fortunate to have a policies paper on this topic accepted at that symposium. And that also was a precursor to this presentation today, which I'll quickly review in 10 or 15 minutes kind of the main topic, uh, uh, topic areas from that presentation. And then kind of the, the main Focal point of our presentation today, looking at advanced air mobility, AAM, as you'll see abbreviated, and modeling and simulation, kind of the marriage of these disciplines as we see it. Then we'll go into the state of the art. We'll show you what's new and exciting here in 2020 and 2021 through a series of case studies and a statement of the state of the art. I'll quickly summarize. We'll go over our bibliography. Putting this together was a labor, truly a labor of love and we'll save uh, 10 or 15 minutes at the very end for some discussion. Okay, by way of introduction, some terminology. Again, part of our learning experience in putting this tutorial together, advanced air mobility. Uh, definition, safe development of an air transportation system that will move people and cargo 
between locations often underserved by aviation using revolutionary new forms of aircraft. So AAM is kind of the technology that NASA has adopted and, and of course as, as part of our presentation we've, uh, we've done so as well. AAM includes something that many, maybe some of you have heard of, urban air mobility, which is a safe and efficient air transportation system focusing on small package delivery, drones, passenger carrying air taxis, which operate above populated areas. And this modern day notion of flying cars falls within the domain of the more formalized AAM concept. But what's the relevance? You know, obviously this is a topic that's bleeding edge, very current. How is it related to ITSEC? How is it related to a variety of modeling and simulation practitioners? This is gonna be a theme that we come back to really throughout this entire presentation. Uh, but I come from the field of transportation and my feeling, generally speaking, is that this could be a small but critical component of the transportation network of tomorrow. And some technologists have theorized that, you know, while flying cars, this notion of flying cars maybe seems nearer to science fiction than science fact, some technologists have said we may be able to see some of these for commercial use by 2025. Me being a bit of a pessimist, a realist maybe, I think that's overly optimistic, maybe 2030, 2035, uh, but let's see how the next few years play out. But certainly relevance to modeling and simulation, we would argue, as these emergent capabilities will advise the future deployment of flying cars. We're going to talk throughout today a lot about LVC, which many of us in this room are intimately familiar with, the live virtual constructive taxonomy. But LVC models and simulations will be necessary for testing, experimentation, evalu evaluation and validation, and hopefully deployment of these technologies in the very near future, with many downstream impacts on all the areas of interest here at ITSIC. As I mentioned previously, training, simulation, education, of course, humans in our interrelation with the system, human performance, human engineering, and of course, innovative technologies as well. Back to our themes this year, not surprisingly, training is almost always a theme in uh, the conference themes here at ITSEC. Adapting to an unexpected future, of course, that uh, we can all surmise is piggybacking off the recent tragedies of the, of the COVID-19 experience. But what we're seeing here, I think, is perhaps the beginnings of the changing face of human transportation within a fully integrated ground and air ecosystem. COVID-19 has affected all of us and has permanently altered the landscape for future urban and regional planning. Um, many of us for the past year, year plus, year and a half, we've had to work remotely. And I think many of us have found out that we can be effective in doing so. But that's left some, a conundrum that we have to find solutions for, perhaps repurposing of geography, structures, office parks, shopping malls, plazas, parking lots uh, that might find themselves unused for businesses that have failed or office parks that are no longer used because much of the workforce now is, is working remotely or working from home. So perhaps this is an opportunity in the transportation sector for transformative, high risk, high reward opportunities to improve and revolutionize transportation, sustainability, and logistics. Okay, finally, please thank you for uh, indulging me on that extremely long preamble. Here are our learning objectives. Number one, identify the current state of the art with flying car technologies. That will then enable us to summarize some of the transportation challenges that mandate societal change and evolution, much of which I've talked through and given an overview on the last few slides. Then we can apply LVC fundamentals to enable sustenance and sustainability of flying car technologies. Then we can analyze a few timely case studies. What's the current state of the art to assess the associated impacts, both te technological and those related to human factors. Finally then, for closure, we can evaluate to forecast next steps for leveraging modeling and simulation in this highly emergent domain of interest. Okay, background. And you'll see, we tried to put this deck together in a very media-heavy way. 
What I learned in, in my literature review is there are so many different designs out there, ranging, ranging from sketches on the drawing board all the way to full-size, live, full-scale prototypes that are being tested today in year 2021. But are these flying cars or are they driving planes? Uh, whatever the vehicle type, they combine the ideal, ideal characteristics of both planes and cars. They'll utilize the 3D airspace but also utilize the 2D ground workspace that we're all used to in driving our own vehicles uh, on the surface. But many differences between proposed vehicles at various stages of prototyping. Uh, is it a car with wings, more like what we would consider to be a flying car, or is it more like an airplane with wheels, more like a driving plane? And maybe the sweet spot here, I would argue, is you know, flying cars maybe could more closely resemble a gyrocopter and minimize dead weight items like wheels and axles and transmission that are required for ground transport but wouldn't be required for flight. So that top, top image up there we're going to come back to a few times. That's kind of emerged as one of my favorites that's, that's uh, out there and being developed right now. But the main point being is you want your flying car or whatever you call it to be a car when you need it to be a car, a plane when you need it to be a plane and you don't want to have to deal with all the superfluous aspects of the system when you're in the opposite mode of travel. But like I said earlier, ride share, and I think we don't have to stretch our imagi imaginations to realize this. One of the industries that we know are probably going to be the, veriest early uh, the very earliest adopters of this technology. Companies like Uber and Lyft, who have already invested millions of dollars investigating the potential of these technologies. But they're forecasting VTOL, or vertical takeoff and landing, vehicles that are easier to fly than helicopters in a dedicated and most likely in the near term segregated airspace. But this so-called on-demand aviation has the potential to improve urban mobility. For example, and I think again this is something we can all relate to, reduce time for daily commutes, depending on again your distance from your workplace and the length it, it takes you uh, to get from point A to point B. But these niche requirements, short range, point to point, egress, could dictate near-term ad adoption logistics, which we'll, we'll kind of come back to at various points throughout this, this presentation. But I urge all of you, among the literature that we surveyed to put this presentation together, together, one of the most impressive documents that I came across was the Uber Elevate initiative. If these technologies resonate with any of you, please Google Uber Elevate if you do nothing after seeing this presentation. PDFs, planning, renderings, videos, it's, it's amazing how much time and thought and strategic vision that Uber has already put into this uh, to potentially motivate and inspire investors, scientists, poli policymakers to realize this future strategic vision in, in, in the d discipline of transportation. I don't know about any of you, but I love these hype cycle curves. It's a way to look at kind of new and recent and bleeding edge technologies and, and kind of see where they all fall relative to each other, this so-called hype cycle. But flying autonomous vehicles are certainly representative of a very recent innovation trigger. You can see on this figure that I referenced from literature in, in 2019, uh, very near on, and on the steep part of the, of the innovation trigger curve. And that, many would argue, puts them approximately where self-driving cars were five or ten years ago on that curve. And here we are a decade later still waiting for uh, self-driving cars to arrive. In fact, you see on this curve autonomous driving level five right near the top, autonomous driving level four kind of approaching that trial of disillusionment. But with these advanced, bleeding edge, really out there technologies, this hype cycle is kind of the way things go. You start with an innovation trigger, everybody's excited, you reach that peak of inflated expectations over some amount of time, you come down to a, a trial of disillusionment where you kind of dismiss it and say, ah, that was, that was nothing. But then that's usually when progress starts being made, where you have that slope of enlightenment and then finally a plateau of productivity. For my own self in my career, which is I'm, I'm about 20 years in, I can't, can't believe it when I say that, but when I started about 20 years ago, 
VR was the next big, big thing, you know, late 90s, early 2000s. And I think we, we can all relate to how VR crashed and burned. You know, way back then it was not very good. It was very, very expensive. It was more a, a toy than anything. It wasn't really a useful tool in my professional opinion. And I got to a point, you know, 10, 12 years ago where I just waved it off. And, but here we are, you know, we've seen Oculus, HoloLens, Google Glass, and all these other technologies where, where now we're finally getting somewhere with VR. We're actually making meaningful progress. So anyways, all this to say, you can see where flying cars fall within all these other technologies, many of which are being featured and highlighted as part of professional development and on our exhibition floor throughout the week here at ITSEC. But forecasters are, are, are predicting a big market potential. So projection of over 100 billion by a little over a decade from now with something like a quarter of a million employees, we can probably forecast that these devices are gonna be piloted in the early stages and then perhaps later autonomous. You know, we keep hearing again with autonomous vehicles, we're not there yet. We don't have enough trust in the system. Um, I'd like to think that that's gonna come over time, but I guess time will tell. Likely to start carrying cargo, perhaps passengers after that, uh, but with reduced operating and maintenance costs, perhaps VTOLs could be cheaper than the $9 per mile it now costs to fly on a helicopter, especially if the highly paid pilot is removed from the loop and perhaps moved elsewhere in the control loop uh, into other highly skilled positions. But potential applications, and I'm sure many of you have seen this on the news, you know, maybe soon Amazon will be bringing packages to our doorstep by way of drones. Um, I don't know if anyone in this room is crazy enough to eat pizza at Domino's. A show of hands, does anyone like Domino's pizza? Everyone's, oh, a few people, a few brave souls. Okay, I don't love their pizza. I come from Buffalo where we have great pizza there, and I'm sure many of you in your cities also do, but kudos to their innovation. Who, do, who wouldn't want a pizza delivered to your doorstep uh, using a, a flying car-like device? But we're already seeing kind of companies dabbling with these technologies to see uh, if we can make it all work. But then maybe eventually larger air shuttles hauling merchandise between warehouses. Maybe eventually ferrying passengers to and from the airport. Perhaps already transport of military troops from a safe hub directly into the battlefield. And we'll talk soon about how the military is already adopting these technologies. But as I mentioned earlier, as you can probably all surmise, many challenges to get to where we wanna go. And at the top of it all are, are regulatory obstacles associated with advanced air mobility that will require cooperative MS modeling simulation with ITSEC policies relative, uh, ITSEC relevance to PSMA, policy standards management and acquisition. Uh, a few categories, as I said earlier, we, we presented a paper a few years ago and I'm gonna quickly go over some of the, the, the most major talking points. But all of these areas here, I'm sure are no surprise to you. Safety, always a primary, primary driver for technological viability. Sustainability, legal standards, economies of scale, of scale. How do we get these technologies, flying cars, to be demonstrated, to prove their worth and viability, but then make them stay and make them sustain? Logistics, not only from adoption patterns, that is to say, who will use them first and then second and then third and so on, but logistics from the point of view of moving other than people, cargo, uh, goods, services, and so forth. Environmental, I certainly don't mean to get political today, but I think we have to develop these technologies in a responsible way where we have our environment in mind, and that is to say, fuel and energy sources, emissions, noise uh, concerns. Navigation, so standards for VTOL, especially if we're dealing with an integrated uh, airspace. We have to make sure that these types of devices play well with commercial aviation, with military aviation. Uh, Vertiport design and layout and geometry. So hubs, you know, that have been deemed vertiports where these flying cars might take off and land or where you park and go from point A to point B. Cybersecurity, a big theme here at ITSIC, always, certainly when you're dealing with 
systems of systems where digital computers are involved, artificial intelligence, machine learning, we have to forecast and regulate cyber crimes uh, before they happen. By the way, I love this gift down here. Real quick, kind of shows you, you know, the advantage of flying cars and comparing a ground egress in red at 23 minutes to a comparative flying car egress in, in eight minutes. Certainly idealized, but in one uh, animated GIF, it kind of shows uh, what the advantages are. A couple other videos here that I love. One on the top, kind of way from the way past, where we imagined flying cars 75 years ago, all the way down to Airbus's uh, current vision, which I hinted at earlier, uh, which, which I'll say a few more words about. But some of our challenges, again, safety. Any publicized adverse safety incidences, incidents can taint public perception and limit consumer acceptance. Uh, with, with ground vehicles, autonomous ground vehicles, you know, 10 years ago we were seeing all these great things in the news, it's the way of the future. And then within a short period of time, about five years ago, there were two accidents where human life was lost. And that, I think, set us back 20 years. You know, when, when these types of things happen, people aren't gonna trust the system. And when you have a situation like that, it's, it's gonna be difficult for these technologies to sustain and grow. But flying cars, as we all can surmise, is, are gonna have to have redundancy and safe mode capabilities, on-the-fly decision-making, where things, especially when you're airborne, are so much more critical. You have to have a plan A and a plan B and a plan C and a plan D and so on in case things go wrong. Sustainability, we're dealing with uh, design complexity, speeds, especially again when airborne, that are much faster than standard ground vehicles. So flying cars we know will mandate sustainable legal standards, not only for the design uh, of these various vehicle types that we'll sample throughout today, but operating and piloting these vehicles, maintenance is gonna be a huge sector, ground air control, and, and so forth. But that pop-up next uh, video on the bottom, I think is, is just terrific because it's a flight vehicle when it needs to be, it's a ground vehicle when it needs to be, and, and this transition zone, I think, is really clever. At the very end of today as an epilogue, I'll show you a, a much longer video of uh, Airbus's strategic vision for the pop-up next vehicle, as they've called it. Logistics, staged initial deployment to meet our most critical transportation requirements. As is probably not surprising, and certainly preaching to the choir here at ITSEC, military are gonna be our first adopters, and appropriately so. Using flying car-like contraptions for mission critical uh, circumstances, for national security types of events. Maybe after that, I would surmise, would be emergency vehicles. You know, maybe we have pl flying police cars, flying firefighter vehicles, flying construction vehicles, even fr flying ambulances, as is shown here on, uh, on, the t on, the, on this top image. Niche corporations, we've already talked about rideshare, we've already talked about how rideshare is already looking into uh, this, their strategic vision for, for this uh, emerging sector and have been for the last five or six years. And then finally, maybe it'll trickle down to, you know, us peons, the civilians. I think, you know, Bezos and uh, Musk and Trump, they're all going to be first. You know, they've got the money. Uh, but eventually, with economies of scale, perhaps this will be a, a civilian matter as well. As I said earlier, green concerns are going to be critical here regarding energy sources, you know, fuel versus electric versus hybrid, which is probably our, our, our best short-term solution, as is the case currently with ground vehicles. We're seeing lots of hybrid cars, uh, resource consumption, noise ordinances, and emissions are, are all going to be critical and, and fall into this general category. Navigation, you know, thinking through how we can have many of these vehicles skyborne cooperating simultaneously, cooperating with each other, humans cooperating with their own vehicle, cooperating with other vehicles, and cooperating with the surrounding infrastructure. This is, there's gonna be many challenges here. So there's gonna be some heads up display requirements that I think need to be thought through. Perhaps it's embedded in the glass displays that are around you. Perhaps the pilot will get on board and put on 
a headset that helps and assists with safe navigation amongst other flying cars, as it were. But instead of floating intersections, floating lane markers, and roadway signage, which of course is, is not possible, we could use augmented reality to foster 3D lane changes, elevation transitions, turns, you know, exiting the highway, the 3D highway, as it were. But these vehicles, we know, are gonna be complex. The interface that you, once we get inside these vehicles, where touch, voice, and gesture recognition, and perhaps even hand and eye tracking are gonna be essential. And all of this plays into the human interface. You know, many of us over the last two, three, five, eight, ten years, we've seen our own ground vehicles become overwrought maybe with safety features. Safety features are good, but we're, we're almost reaching, reaching the point where perhaps it's critical mass of you know, mental and cognitive workload. When does it reach a point where our vehicles are so quote unquote safe that they become dangerous to operate? So this is always a, a tug of war, a yin yang if you will, to, to kind of determine what that sweet spot should be. So thinking about infrastructure, I talked about this terminology vertiports a few slides back, but we have to think about where will these safe takeoffs and landings take place? What do these structures look like? What is the geometry? Where do they go in urban, rural, suburban settings? Vehicle storage, vehicle parking, all these issues need to be thought through. And the design and layout of these structures, whatever they're ultimately called, will certainly require models and simulations to guarantee human safety, but also optimize operational efficiency. Because in the end, that's what we're trying to do. We don't wanna just create this marketplace that has a wow factor for the sake of doing it. We're trying to make our lives from a transportation, from an intermodal transportation perspective to be more convenient, to be more user friendly. Cybersecurity, I talked about this earlier. We have to protect these, what we know will be highly sensitive, complex, and computationally uh, leveraged devices from hackers, terrorists, or other cyber criminals. So certainly stochastic models and simulations are gonna enable the risk assessment that's gonna be required, trillions of hours of risk assessment to establish uh, countermeasures to try to circumvent problems before they happen. But it all comes back to policy standards, regulations, they're gonna be the primary drivers for technological development and dictate test evaluation, validation, and we hope sustainable, sustainable deployment of these technologies. Models, simulations, live virtual constructive taxonomy is gonna be essential to establish guidelines for scalability, for efficiency, for cost effectiveness. I hinted at this earlier, I'll come back to it later. What good are these devices if they're so unaffordable that only the wealthiest human beings can afford them? but also sustainability. Like I said, we're trying to play the long game here. Um, we wanna make sure we get through that hype cycle and really make productivity in the next 10, 20, and 50 years. Uh, shameless bit of self-promotion, uh, ITSIC paper 19140 from two years ago. In the interest of time, these were a lot of the issues that we explored uh, in that paper, so please do see the ITSIC repository, this paper should be freely available to all of you uh, if you're interested in additional details. Okay, this slide here is a shout out to a couple of things. Number one, the past. And again, going into my exploration of flying cars, when I did my literature review, I thought flying cars was two things. Number one, the Jetsons from my childhood. And number two, being a science fiction buff, movies like Blade Runner. I never knew that in the 1940s, there was an, 75 years ago, uh, there was an actual <laughs> precursor to what is the modern day vision of a, a flying car. This Convair model, 116, 118, uh, check this out on Google. I'm, I, I did not Photoshop these images. Uh, but the designer, it turns out, is a guy named Theodore Hall. Again, this is all news to me. Maybe some of you were familiar with this. Uh, tech gurus who may be out there, uh, amazing, amazing vision to think back all those years ago that these types of things were already being thought through and attempted. But the other tribute that this slide is, is to my bird dog from last year who helped us shape this tutorial. Her name is Juliana Sly, and she brought this to my attention because it turns out 
she's a distant relative of Ted Hall. So truly small world, uh, shout out to Juliana and thanks to helping us shape this and to Ted Hall for, for his ama amazing uh, vision back in the day. But real quick, this slide to say a, a couple of what I see as being the major challenges here in the short term for, for technological sustainability. The handoff between manual and autonomous, because we know in the short term it's not gonna be fully autonomous, but it certainly won't be a fully manual type of vehicle. But also, what makes it a flying car? The, the complex transitions between when you're traveling, driving, traveling on the ground when it's a car, when you're at altitude or approaching altitude when it's considered a plane, how do the dynamics take place between these kind of two transition zones? Uh, that's a major challenge that's gonna have to be um, figured out. And as we'll soon see, many different proposed technologies for how to tackle this. Advanced air mobility and modeling and simulation. After all, that's why we're here at ITSIC this year. We know going in this is gonna rely on physical test beds, physical testing. So full-scale examination of prototype flying car vehicles to help improve our understanding of all the interdisciplinary operational challenges that await us, many of which we've already kind of discussed here today on a notional level. VTOL capabilities, vertical takeoff and landing like a helicopter, we know that many of these vehicles are gonna adopt and embrace these. Essential for, to ensure operational feasibility, certainly in dense urban environments, where we know flying cars like rideshare are most likely to be transformative. So cityscapes, you know, Orlando, LA, New York City, where you've got lots of buildings, you know, we, we, the, these vehicles are gonna have to go up before they go uh, and travel in the 2D plane horizontally. So we've already kind of thought through and, and re various researchers across the world are already kind of looking into scaled or miniature live testing using drones in enclosed environments. So deploying physical enclosures either inside a building or in a netted outdoor structure so we don't upset the, the FAA to encapsulate and constrain your testing region. So here we can prototype and pre-visualize conceptual urban planning and design. You know, we talked earlier about how we can perhaps re-envision re cityscapes and buildings and geography that's being un unused or under underutilized in, in, in recent times. Uh, so cityscapes, heliports, takeoff and landing zones at partial scale, and perhaps we could even leverage additive manufacturing for cost-effective model development. So thinking through how we can do this at scale, how we could build things on a small scale, build a miniature cityscape, have 10, 20, 50 people operating drones, get in there and fly these drones around and, and help us surmise the questions that we haven't thought through yet. And then we can obviously advance to uh, full scale live testing as it becomes appropriate. But also part of this puzzle is virtual testing and human factor simulation. After all, we as humans are gonna be interacting with these machines. Uh, for excursions that involve both airborne and ground egress, and that at least again in the short term are gonna be both manual and autonomous systems. We know there's gonna be transition zones, takeoffs, landings, but between when it's a, a, a car and when it's a, a plane. And these are gonna be most critical during preliminary deployment when operations are manual and when we're gonna have a greater volume of pilots for which we're gonna need training to understand, again, what our human relationship is with these complex systems. So certainly simulation is gonna enable the assessment of tolerance for the human machine interface. We're gonna be seeing a lot of these technologies, motion systems, display systems, projectors, 4K, 8K, and so forth, when our exhibition floor opens at two o'clock this afternoon. And for me, it's always a playground, so I can't wait to see uh, what's new and exciting. But in my view, in my professional view, this is maybe where it, should, where it should all begin. And as simple as this animated GIF is on the top right-hand side of this slide, to me, this is kind of where we should start the thought process. And this is, of course, 3D traffic or, or grid models, whatever we want to call this. So leveraging and embracing game engine technologies, as the military has done in recent times and for so long, 
to determine flying car flight network interoperation. Again, interop interoperation of the driver and his or her vehicle with other vehicles, with the surrounding infrastructure, which we can surmise is all gonna be connected by artificial intelligence, sensors, sensor fusion, machine learning, and so forth. But we have to translate what, what we know now and what we're already doing now in 2D for ground traffic modeling to effect, effectively utilized, utilize the third dimension of travel and going vertical. So my colleagues and I have dabbled with car following lane changing models to do microscopic and macroscopic ground vehicle simulation. There's softwares that do this, VizSim, Paramics, Transims, and so forth. We need to be thinking about the analog in 3D space to figure out how to make that idealized depiction on top uh, actually work and function in, in a surmised future so that we can maximize cooperative flow within these travel tiers or grids, uh, whatever you want to call them, while again guaranteeing safety uh, but, but maximizing uh, throughput. Because again, that's what we're trying to do is, is have as many vehicles per unit time, per unit space, safely functioning and cooperating together at the same time. So what I've just hinted at in the last few so slides is in fact LVC and how it's gonna be required with models and simulations in this advanced air mobility realm. So as you all know, and for those that don't, LVC, Live Virtual Constructive, it's a taxonomy for research, simulation, and training, which again is gonna be essential for testing, experimentation, and validation of, of AAM. So live, we're gonna use live testing for partial scale, U UAVs, drones, as I hinted at a few slides back and full-scale piloted testing of flying cars within a physical environment. And here again, you're using real people and real systems, and that's the L and LVC. This will enable us to examine infrastructure and navigation concerns. For example, vertiport layout, geometry, features, and placement to safely, but oper from an operational efficiency standpoint, enable these takeoffs and landings. Virtual, that's probably closest to you know, my domain of specialty uh, over the last number of years, but using high fidelity motion-based simulation uh, will be required using real people and simulated systems, and that's the V and LVC. So these will be essential, for example, to examine co the complex human-machine interface, transitions between driving flight modes, and V to X communications, as I've hinted at previously, vehicles, other vehicles, infrastructure, and of course, we, the humans in the loop. Constructive, using micro simulations of vehicle egress and interactions using simulated people and simulated systems. That, of course, is the C in LVC. To examine third dimension traffic models. So it's been pleasing for me to see, for me to see and learn, and even some of my colleagues at Buffalo are using these advanced uh, organic technology, studying organic systems like birds and insects to see how they behave in swarms. So called, so called swarm behavior, swarm optimization, swarm intelligence. Can we learn from that as hinted by this somewhat comical image on the lower right to figure out how these types of flying car, real world, real systems can behave? Uh, to me that's interesting and fascinating and um, researchers are already looking into this conundrum. How can you come to ITSEC and not mention the word training? Whether you're doing a tutorial or a paper or a workshop or you're selling equipment or software on the exhibition floor, training is at the center of it all here at ITSEC, both military and civilian. And hopefully from what we've all learned already in this tutorial, uh, we know that training is gonna be imperative uh, in this bleeding edge and highly emerging sector. Not only for designing, you know, the skill design of these types of vehicles, but certainly for operation. So thinking about pilot certification. We know that pilots are gonna require skill licensure for these vehicles that both drive and fly. Type cer certification. We know that at least initially, all of these vehicles are gonna deem be deemed experimental. So pilot approval, specialized pilot approvals for different vehicle types, and again, that comes back to 
is it more like a flying car? Is it more like a driving plane? Or does it truly occupy that kind of sweet spot right in between? Maintenance. You know, many of us can maintain our own cars. You know, changing the brake pads, changing the oil, changing the tires, routine types of things. But we know with a flying car where the stakes, the design stakes are gonna be so much higher, we're dealing with highly complex systems, many moving parts, many perspective points of failure, many computers, opportunities for cyber crimes. Maintenance is gonna be a major area where, where, where highly skilled training is, is relied upon. Okay, maybe a blessing in disguise why this tutorial was delayed a year. Like I said, due to the COVID pandemic last year, due to my own personal circumstances, we opted to delay a year. Uh, right around when this tutorial would have been due a year ago, in the mail I received a magazine from National Defense, which many of you may uh, subscribe to uh, or obtain digitally on their website, a cover story on flying cars. So when we were preparing this tutorial early last year, we had our doubts. You know, this tutorial subcommittee, the, the crowd, they're gonna laugh us out of the room, this is crazy. But then when I saw this article, I said, wait a minute, if, if the military is doing this, we're safe, we're, we're golden, we're visionaries. You know, we went from the chumps to, oh my gosh, these people are, are way ahead of the curve. So it was affirming to see this article, but it was a great cover story called, Flying Cars, Air Force Aims to Turn Science Fiction into Science Fact. I, again, just absolutely perfect. But I implore all of you, go, go back in your archives, check this one out. Uh, they discuss the USAF Agility Prime Initiative. Uh, please check out their website for further details. On one slide, I'm trying to encapsulate and summarize this great article, and timely article. But they're building a takeoff uh, like a helicopter uh, VTOL vehicle that will then fly like an airplane, vertically oriented vehicles that transition to be forward oriented, again, once at altitude with this VTOL feature electric hybrid propulsion and electric power source, either manned, remote, or autonomous operational capability. So they're you know, thinking through the exact same issues. VTOL with reduced life cycle costs. Many challenges uh, as they surmised and, and summarized in this article, uh, many of which we've already talked through in this presentation today. Legitimate concerns about safety, security and privacy need to be addressed, you know, already forecasting uh, holes for terrorists, cyber crimes, and things of this nature. Uh, without public acceptance, they also realize that commercial commercialization, mass commercialization simply won't be possible. So again, shout out to this great cover story and certainly timely to, to what we've been dabbling in in the last number of years. Okay, let's go into some case studies, which is to say what's the state of the art? I'll again come back to my conversation a couple of years ago with Panos. I, I had no idea. I truly had no idea that this immature field was as mature as it actually is. So for the next 15 minutes or so, I just want to show you what, what we found and really, truly just touch the tip of the iceberg of what's out there. But urban air mobility is a modern day disruptor. I love that term, you know, kind of turning problems on their head. Intermodal transportation is something that affects all of us. It's obviously a problem. It's obviously a priority. Again, not to get political, but federal leadership has just put in a trillion plus dollars into modernizing our, our, our infrastructure. Let's, let's hope, truly hope they do some good with those dollars. But this is something that could have a positive impact um, on all of us. Um, but this sector is a disruptor for end-to-end -end mobility solutions. Numerous manufacturers, both ranging from startup to all the big players, all the well-known players are developing prototypes, flying cars, air taxis, passenger drones. And here in the next 10, 15 minutes, we're just gonna present a, bl a brief sampling of some of these pr prospective technologies currently at various stages in development. By the way, I love this image because it kind of shows the big picture, a strategic vision of the big picture. Not just one vehicle, but 
vehicles interacting with other vehicles, interacting with the current cityscape, showing what heliports look like, how humans interact with the system, how vehicles interact with other vehicles and, and each other. We have, to, we have to solve and tackle this problem holistically. Um, I love this figure, and I apologize, it's slightly fuzzy. Actually, it doesn't look too bad from my eyes right here, because um, it kind of summarizes a lot of the nomenclature and semantics that we've already, some of which we've already gone over, but all of which are relevant to the various vehicles that are, that are in the marketplace today. So we've already talked through passenger drones, flying cars, air taxis, and all this terminology. But on the right there are, are, are the TALs, the, the TOL, takeoff and landing. VTOL we've already mentioned, vertical takeoff and landing, like a helicopter. We know that many of these vehicles are gonna re require that. STOL, short takeoff and landing, so short runway takeoffs, which would maybe be more truly like, like a flying car as we'd think of it. CTOL, conventional takeoff and landing, you know, more like a, a conventional aircraft. And then EVTOL, a special version of a VTOL vehicle, which are electric or, or battery powered. Okay, three slides, six designs. I picked them somewhat arbitrarily, but, but all interesting and fascinating nonetheless. Uh, the opener backfly is, has a VTOL capability, single passenger. Uh, weight, we know, is gonna be an obvious issue here, again, depending on your power source. Eight rotors, so kind of like a, a full-size quadcopter. Short range, 25 miles. That's also something that's gonna need to be thought through with these types of vehicles. What are you using them for? Where are you going? What's your round trip distance? Uh, charging locations, all, all these issues need to be thought through. So maybe geared for non-urban environments, daylight only flight, another thing we need to think through as is the case with all kind of smaller aircraft, uh, backed by Google co-founder Larry Page. Uh, the Rolls-Royce eVTOL, like I said, some of the major players are already dabbling in the flying car sector. Uh, electric, vertical takeoff and landing, this one en enables five passengers. Looks a little bit more like a modern day helicopter we can all see there. Turbine powered, which serves as a generator with six propellers. And this one, as you can see, is, is geared for much longer range. So looking at about 500 miles here. Okay, right out of a James Bond movie, the Aston Martin Volante, VTOL, three passenger, hybrid electric power, autonomous flight capable, ultra sleek form factor, that one's uh, so, so cool looking, I think. Uh, built in partnership with Cranfield, Cranfield Aerospace and also Rolls-Royce are part of that design. This one I've mentioned at numerous points throughout today, maybe my personal favorite, and I have no stake in its design, I just think it kind of hits a nice sweet spot. The Audi Airbus pop-up next vehicle, which is a VTOL quadcopter module companion with a two-passenger city car pod. So both electric and fully autonomous, which is a drone-like flying taxi that you see in the air, pairing with an electric city uh, two-passenger vehicle on the ground. And again, at the very end, I'll show another video to, to, to show their strategic vision. Finally, the, these last two I learned are maybe some of the longer term players in this marketplace. Uh, the Terrafugia TFX VTOL vehicle, 100 foot diameter, you can see it's got kind of a wide uh, footprint. Hybrid electric vehicle, four passenger, operates on unleaded fuel uh, that will power electric motor pods and a long 500 mile range in cooperation with Volvo. And then finally, the Pal V Liberty. We've actually been in some cooperative discussions with them. They have an STOL gyrocopter. Again, short takeoff and landing. So it can't go straight up like many of these other vehicles can. It will rely on some form of a runway. Dual engine, 100, 200 horsepower with unleaded fuel as their source. Two passenger, moderate 250 mile range with a seven gallon per hour fuel e economy. So a brief sampling, again, tip of the iceberg, I would estimate there's 50 or more players out there in the marketplace. As we've hinted at already numerous times, we have to forecast what will the human machine interface look like? And we're already struggling with this 
with autonomous ground vehicles. We talked earlier about level four, high automation, level five, full automation. What 10 years ago was being promised by automakers, now many expert technologists are looking ahead and saying, this might be a utopia point, something we aim for, but that, that is truly realistically unachievable. So we can learn from this. We're behind in, in the flying car sector, but we can learn from what the ground vehicle autonomous design people are doing right now. And part of our team, so because we have to learn what our relationship is with these vehicles. So part of our team put some surveys together over the past few years to investigate the various human factors associated with flying cars. So here again is just a brief sampling of some of the major results, uh, self-report results that will, we think, influence future policy and regulation. So the first category is kind of the major primary tug of war, looking at benefits versus concerns, and how public perception is, views these areas. Uh, and future adoption is gonna be directly associated with that individual kind of risk versus reward proposition. Benefits, as we can all probably guess, not surprising from the survey results, reduce travel time, increase travel reliability, especially if we look way ahead where, you know, now on the ground we have gridlock, we have congestion, we have construction, we have weather, we have road repairs. If we can pull some meaningful percentage of our ground vehicle traffic into the air, that can reduce some of our problems uh, and, and make travel more efficient. Concerns, again, maybe not surprisingly, most apprehensive about weather, Maybe not so much a concern down here where I'm from, weather's a concern 10, 10 months out of the year. Uh, interactions with other vehicles, we talked about this earlier, the constructive figuring out how vehicles interact with each other and with the system and, and trust in autonomy, uh, a lot of concerns there from a, from a human factors perspective. Uh, use cases in three categories, the activity, the duration, and the time of day. So activity, kind of fairly even across the board, but the two winners were, perhaps not surprisingly, use of, of these types of vehicles for entertainment and for work commutes. Uh, duration, at first glance I was surprised by this, that people said longer durations. You know, 50 miles, maybe not so much. 100 miles, more so, two, 300 miles, even more so. But then when I thought about it, that kind of makes sense, because when you're dealing with you know, unless you've got an, a, a heliport in your backyard where you can literally walk out your back door and, and get into your flying car and go from point A to point B, there's probably still gonna be some travel going to a central hub. So there has to be kind of a minimum time and distance where these types of durations make sense. So I, I guess on second thought, that, that middle portion of the curve made more sense to me. Time of day, more likely to use during daylight hours than evening hours, not surprising. Uh, I'm somebody who doesn't like to fly. I'm sure that's somewhat of a common sentiment. Uh, and I always feel safer flying during the daylight. I, I don't know, maybe I just wanna see, <laughs> if my plane's going down, I wanna see, I wanna see where, where it's going to. Um, I don't know, I, but whenever we see adverse accidents with small aircraft, most often it's during times when field of view is bad. It's nighttime, the, the, the cloud cover is low, there's fog. Um, so, you know, maybe with these lower altitude vehicles, that's a concern that needs to be carefully thought through. Uh, willingness to acquire and hire these vehicles. Maybe not so affordable in the short term, but I'd like to think in my lifetime, I just turned 50. If I've got 40 good years left, thinking again optimistically, maybe Uber by then. You know, I, I think they'll tell me, oh yeah, 10 years. But uh, we all know how those promises typically play out. But bleeding edge technologies tend to be expensive once initially deployed, and then prices come way down, just like was the case with cars, personal computers. You know, when I was in grade school, Nobody had computers. I'd go in the library and look at this Apple IIe thing and type on it, and I had no idea what they were for. They weren't affordable back then. Now, today, 99.9% .9 of households have PCs, laptops, and so forth. The same we can forecast 
would happen with this marketplace. But willingness to pay, I found this interesting. As many as 40 people said, if it's in the 100,000 price range, they would consider uh, an investment. Of course, this is just a survey. It wasn't uh, a promissory note of any, any form. But not surprisingly, you see uh, the numbers come down as prices go up. Um, willingness to hire. Interesting here, and, but, but maybe not surprising upon reflection. Uh, need to establish further trust and automation. People felt slightly more comfortable if there was a human driver, a pilot, an operator, whatever you call the person overseeing the operations of this vehicle, as opposed to getting in a vehicle in the short term that's fully autonomous. So no surprise there. Finally, rate expectations, thinking ahead that maybe the Ubers and the Lyfts are gonna be the first opportunity for many of us to explore this. Uh, where rideshare, we, we know, is gonna be more costly than ground-based travel, at least to start. And humans, we found, are willing to pay a little bit more than current ground rates per mile of travel. Uh, so the thre thresholds you can see there, people expect maybe a dollar more per mile, three dollars more per mile, and then a sharp decline. So thinking about, let's say, the airport here, I don't know if, how many miles that is, let's say 10 miles, 20 bucks, so two dollars per mile on the ground. Let's say that's three dollars more per mile, that's a fifty dollar trip from the airport here. I think many of us, f for the Novelty of going in a flying car, we do it once, but um, those rates are certainly gonna have to come down to make it uh, be viable. But testing experimentation in LVC, we've already kind of talked through this. Uh, and in my view, the priority goes in reverse. I think these are gonna have to be explored in tandem, in parallel, but the priority should be C then V then L. Constructive experimentation to enable preliminary exploration of forecasted interactions between the V to X, humans, vehicles, infrastructure. Almost as important, virtual evaluation is gonna serve as a preliminary point of, point of entry to advise vehicle operational traits. And then finally, most important, but probably has to come last, live prototyping. Both partial and full scale will be necessary to emulate forecasted transport modes. So a quick few slides showing the current state of the art in T&E that will certainly directly enable these types of technological and human factors evaluations. This flowchart upon first glance is a jumbled mess and I apologize, it actually comes out of a proposal that our team recently wrote to a federal agency, trying to get their attention, trying to say this, this is important, you've gotta give us some money. Uh, but we're proposing an instrument, a major research instrument to advance, to, to attempt to advance flying car sustainability. Like I said, LVC is at the heart of it all. L for a live physical flying car testing framework with real people and systems. V for virtual using high fidelity simulation and C for constructive to look at those ever important 3D traffic flows to figure out this cooperation once we go vertical in mass. But building the instrument is only part of the challenge. It's, that's a, a design challenge, but what comes next? And that is as important. So if we have this type of taste, testing capability, what are our, our measures? What are we gonna look at? Well, I think most important is human behavior. Drivers, pilots, occupants of these vehicles, looking at things like cognition physiological response, heart rate, oximetry, pulse, uh, mental workload for, you know, at least in the short terms, peop people who are operating these vehicles so that we can uh, see that we're in that kind of sweet spot of uh, human tolerance. But then even what comes next? What's beyond that? Where do we want to go with all this? And I would argue that the primary ar outcomes are many of the issues that we've kind of talked through today. Policies and standards, regulations. We know that, that all this is gonna to need to be approved for these technologies to become truly become commonplace. Environmental issues, infrastructure impacts, not just the vehicle, but the supporting inf infrastructure to make sure we can support these types of vehicles. 
and at the heart of it all here at ITSEC as well, from numerous perspectives, all those advanced training requirements. So again, shameless self-promotion. Uh, this is a facility that we recently built uh, at the University of Buffalo. This isn't the only such facility. In fact, there are even larger versions of this type of facility. But this is our structure for outdoor autonomy research, SOAR, a rare case where an acronym ac actually works. Uh, but it's an enclosed test facility for drones, quadcopters, and other UAVs outdoor, but netted. So we, you know, play nice with the FAA. Certainly will enable live testing involving real people and systems. Tethered, full-sized experimentation of basic vehicle maneuvers, for example, EV tall vehicles. Uh, and also scaled down miniature aviation vehicles and ground infrastructure, as I hinted at earlier. NEC in Japan, I think, is already doing this. They're already a couple of years into this. So this type of testing in this type of format uh, is already being done. We were also so fortunate recently to receive an EPIC me mega grants uh, support to build a virtual campus. So we're kind of thinking through uh, a simulator-based environment to look at hybrid ground and flight vehicle testing. And this type of virtual evaluation will, of course, involve real people, simulated systems, and this real-time model, modeling and simulation will enable us to evaluate and assess human factors and human-machine interaction. Okay, second blessing in disguise for why this tutorial was delayed a year. Almost a year to the day, November of 2020. Just before virtual ITSEC last year, I looked online, a colleague actually forwarded me an article and I couldn't believe it. Actually, I'm, I'm not surprised, but entertainment, Orlando, tourism, it all goes hand in hand. We talk about training, simulation, education. We can't forget about entertainment and tourism when here in Orlando. So a year ago, online, Lake Nona, am I pronouncing that right? Lake Nona Vertiport planned for 2025. I think that means 2030, but as we all talked about earlier, I'm, I'm a pessimist, let's wait and see. But proposed as being the first of its kind flying car tourism hub in the United States, all electric five seat vertical takeoff aircraft, a moderate flight range of just under 200 miles within one hour of charging. But I thought these renderings were amazing, shows the vertiport, shows the uh, the, the hub, the parking lot, um, the, the, the entire facility, which, which kind of gives a holistic picture of, of how they see this playing out. So who knows, maybe in five years we will, as tourists, get to fly in one of these things and, and, and see what it's all about. Okay, AAM, I would argue, is a small but important potential component of the transportation network of tomorrow. Transportation affects all of us, I would argue strongly, it's bipartisan. We all rely on trains, planes, automobiles. Um, and flying cars could potentially be part of our future. One thing we know for certain, one thing I think we can all agree, to make a technology like this work, modeling and simulation is gonna be at the heart of it all. Uh, for capabilities, requirements, for actionable regulations and governance. Technological sustenance will certainly ma mandate LVC, another taxonomy that many or most of us uh, rely upon in our, in our careers for testing, for evaluation, for validation. And many overarching disciplinary impacts upon the foundational pillars of this conference, which I hope we did a good job of summarizing in this presentation those, of course, being the TS and E in our acronym, Training, Simulation, and Education. We tried to hit on the themes of this year. Training, always a theme here at ITSEC. Adapting to an unexpected future. I think if any of us have learned anything over the past almost two years now, it is to anticipate, to expect the unexpected, to plan for a future where we have no idea where the future is gonna take us. Perhaps a timely slide to put uh, a couple of back to the future style of images. I love science fiction in case you can't tell, but uh, 
the Back to the Future car and the Blade Runner vehicle, um, it certainly inspirations for this tutorial. But this modern day notion of flying cars and evolving disruptive technology that is certainly representative of the changing face of human transportation through emerging practices in planning technology policy. In this tutorial, we tried to look at many of the challenges notionally, uh, key modeling and simulation interrelationships and a series of technology-based case studies that, that are illustrative of the current state of the art in this field. How can we talk about MNS LV, and LVC without mentioning verification, validation, and accreditation? Verification is your model right. Validation is the, are you using the right model? Accreditation is external and formal certification of your models and simulations. VVNA to ensure only correct and suitable results are used and to facilitate risk management within the training domain. Certainly we know VVNA is gonna, is gonna be required to, uh, to realize flying cars, but that's all I'm gonna say about it. Why? Because at 2.30 this afternoon, uh, Drs. Youngblood and Petty are presenting a tutorial uh, on VVNA, and they're certainly certifiable experts in this domain. So I'm gonna leave this, that to them. Okay, hopefully a confirmation of our learning objectives. What we try to do here today was identify the current state of the art with flying car technologies, summarize the various transportation challenges that we face today and now that mandate societal change and evolution, broad change, disruptive change, I would strongly argue. To do this, we have to apply LVC, the fundamentals of this taxonomy to enable sustenance and sustainability of these out there flying car technologies. We try to analyze the state of the art, case studies to assess the associated technological and human factors impacts, and this hopefully moving forward will enable us to evaluate and forecast what are our next steps. Where can we go with all this in this highly emerging domain of broad interest? So putting this thing together over the last two years was truly a labor, uh, but it was truly a labor of love. I'll quickly mention that all these tutorials that you'll see today will be made available, digitally available to all of you through the, digi through the ITSEC repository. So no need to jot any of this down now, but we did at the end put an extensive bibliography, which we try to cite uh, each slide throughout. So if any of you, if this resonated with any of you, be sure to download this tutorial. Uh, this bibliography should of course take you uh, to where you need to go, but many, many, many sources went into the construction of this tutorial, uh, which was a lot of fun and a great educational experience to put together. Finally, I'm just down to the last few minutes before I open the floor to questions, but I was gonna put this at the beginning and I decided to put it at the end. And really indulge me because this is mostly for me and not so much for you. But we really did try to put this together with ITSIC in mind. So down the rows, all the kind of topics that we tried to go over today, the major topics with relevance to all the six major subcommittees here at ITSEC, modeling and simulation in general, and then of course LVC, which we came back to uh, many, many times throughout this tutorial today. Real quick, a few but very important shout outs. Number one, our friends in East Aurora at Moog for their ongoing technical financial assistance and support for innovative uh, simulation applications, but also the Stephen Still Institute for Sustainable Transportation and Logistics, dubbed the SSISTL at the University at Buffalo for their amazing strategic vision in the discipline of transportation and for the incredible uh, fiscal support that they've provided. Uh, many, many thanks. Lastly, to all of you for attending for your attention today. Uh, I appreciate it very much. I hope you all feel now like I did three years ago after that discussion with Panos. I walked out of that saying, this, this Panos guy, he's a lunatic. What's he talking about? Flying cars? Are you kidding me? And then I went out there and, and tried to educate myself and found that uh, this could potentially be part of the transfer, transformation of our, of our transportation future. Um, 
So thank you all. I'm going to open the floor to questions and comments now, but while I'm doing that, uh, an epilogue to this tutorial. And again, I can't take credit for this one, but this is the pop-up next technology that I've talked about throughout, and who knows? Maybe this is going to be in a science fiction movie in the next few years, uh, or maybe it'll actually truly be our reality at uh, some time in the near future if we in the modeling and simulation profession actually do our jobs. Thank you again. It was a great pleasure to speak to you today. <laughs> Questions, yes. Okay, great. Uh, so we've been working with Adobe Prime, we're partnering with them in the center space. Uh, we have two certifiable experts here, so. We're certifiable. <laughs> uh, so as, as far as the flying cars, we could even use the term flying cars. Okay. At Apple, because none of the leading vehicles in, this, in the air race have any ground transportation capacity of any of them. Uh, I think there's only one of the about 300 plus models out there. So, so, so vehicles that, that mostly or entirely just fly, is, is that what you're saying? Correct. They're going to fly uh, either uh, on the wing or on the rotor or both, uh, electric propulsion or electric hybrid propulsion uh, systems. Uh, we're looking at training both the operator and the maintainer. Some of them are something other you could have a single operator and maintainer because of the, the electric systems don't have as much applications as uh, traditionally the personal web phone users. And I, I hear you use the word maintainer. Is that the prefer preferred nomenclature for operator, overseer, driver, pilot? So we're looking at operator for a, an operator slash maintainer. Operator maintainer gets to some form of vehicle. Uh, Lyft has got a, a hectocopter, uh, 16 rotor, very, very simple, one, one person Okay. You can change the props with an Allen key. Uh, it's pretty, I've taken this thing apart. It's, it's pretty simple. Wow. Uh, the leading folks in the airspace are Joby, Beta, Kitty Hawk. Um, and the one you're talking about here in Florida, that was known as Lilium, the German company. Uh, we're not working with them, we're working with those companies. So, uh, but what we are saying is, Great, thank you. I mean, in a way, you're making my job easy. So <laughs> my question to you then would be, how far are we away? I mean, am I being pessimistic? Are they being optimistic? Or is it somewhere in between? Okay. Force are 
Great, thank you very much. And you mentioned 300 players in this marketplace? There are over 300 vehicles in the marketplace. Wow. I appreciate the insights very much. Yes. Um, I, I, I wasn't sure if you were asking a question or stating a comment. Well, we, we've looked into kind of creating a, a version of a, a flying car flight trainer. And of course, the availability of these kinds of databases are important to us maybe more from a training perspective. Because um, you're dealing with, I think, lower altitude flight where, like you're saying, maybe the models right now aren't, aren't adequate for that kind of implementation. Um, I don't necessarily have an answer for where we have to go with that, other than to agree with you and say that's a legitimate concern and something we'll need to explore in the near future. Any other questions? All right, thanks, Jeff. Great, thank you all.